Uh, some of Andrew Bartle's family, uh, her brother is a coach, and uh, his daughter plays on the girls' team. Anyway, they tell us over and over how much they appreciate being able to, to stay here in this facility. And in as many ways possible, we want to be able to use this as a place not only for our purposes of gathering for worship and, and for instruction, but to be able to bless the community and be God's people here. Our mission's focus for this, uh, well, finally on Christmas Eve, just pray that all of the preparations that are going into this service will, will come together well, whether it's the music, whether it's the message, the, the various parts of it, it's going to be a, a good service, and I'd like for us to pray that God will be glorified, and people who come, some who come to no other service throughout the year, come on Christmas Eve, and they will hear the message that uh, presents Jesus Christ. Now our mission's focus this week is Catherine Watson, and she is with Christar in Turkey, a young single woman who grew up in Juneau, and we've had her here several times, and uh, we also keep touch with her personally, and she's in a country where their people are Islamic, and, uh, and she is there uh, to represent Christ and works particularly with other women. Uh, pray for Catherine and for God's strength and good help for her. Uh, there's new believers among us in the church family. We're thankful for that and uh, they just continue to pray. Some are facing challenges and struggles. And as I said, uh, June Estrada and her health and Mary Stevens who is going through uh, chemotherapy and cancer treatment back in the Midwest. You may follow the case of the persecuted Christians and are aware of Pastor Saeed and his imprisonment in Iran, and, uh, and the, one of the latest reports is that uh, it being near Christmas time, he had posted a paper, white paper cross in his prison cell that was uh, an angry guard made, it, made him remove it, and so there are people here in this country who, in sympathy to him, are putting a white paper cross on their own Christmas tree just to uh, just to show in their own hearts their, their solidarity with him. But he is just one of, of many thousands and thousands who are suffering as a result of being Christians. And we pray for their strength in that. Now, we'll also be in our service tomorrow hearing a presentation from two of our own young ladies, um, Kaylee Cunningham and Kayla Cook. Both are doing two-year internships down in the Seattle area with Young Life. And we as a church have been supporting them as part of their financial need in doing so. I thought at first they were going to be here tonight, but they aren't. And uh, we'll be tomorrow. So those that are in the service tomorrow will hear them for Kayla and Kaylee. Uh, we do uh, appreciate their, their work that they're doing. Now, uh, before we get into our message tonight, you notice again the Advent brief that we have. I have a helper that's going to come. I'll have her wait just a little bit longer while I say some things, but this is a job I can't do alone without the help. Okay, it's the fourth uh, weekend now of Advent, and so we will be lighting the fourth candle as well as the first three. The number four candle we've assigned to be a symbol of the Magi for the wise men. The first one was of the prophets, the second the angels, the third the shepherds. Now these magi are Persian scholars, not necessarily uh, what we would call biblical scholars or, or people, men who are doctrinally sound, but they were given this designation of wise men and the scripture tells us in Matthew that they came seeking Jesus to worship him. Matthew 2, verse 1 begins, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And verse 9, continuing on, Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go. And make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. I think those of 
us who have been in a culture of Christmas are familiar with the story of the wise men. You've learned nothing new as I have read to the, you these verses here again. So we review this, but uh, keeping in mind too that if we stop and think about it, these magi were the first Gentiles to come and worship the Christ. Whatever their background was, whatever the reason for coming, when they met Jesus face to face, it says they fell down and worshipped him. And then God in his grace opened their eyes to something that even his own people did not see, that he was God in human form. So as we think of the lesson from them, we realize that at great expense and inconvenience they had come seeking him. They returned to their homeland, it tells us, by a different route. Different route geographically, and I'd like to think that they were different in their hearts as well. So I'm going to have Ava and Urias come and help me, and as we light these four candles, it reminds us that light has come into this world, that people tend to respond to that light, either foolishly as Herod did, threatened by one who would assert the throne of their lives, or as wise men, seeking God's king in order to bow down and worship him. So you want to come up here? Amen. So this first one that burns all by itself at first reminds us of prophets who spoke of him years and years before Jesus was born. They didn't know much, just one little light. And then the second one, who can tell me what that is? Might be angels? How about this one? Sorry. Might have these shepherds. Okay, and what's tonight? What's that talking about? I think she said wise men. Thank you. Good job. us and entrusting to us 
that ability to uh, to continue to work here and to, um, to support others as well. Thank you for those who have worked on this uh, physical part of uh, enlarging our building and giving us the capacity for more ministry. And may we be faithful with all that you entrust to us, protect them as they work, and help them to work well. I pray too for uh, Mary Stevens. I pray for June Estrada, others who are, who are physically limited and facing challenges there. And uh, not only do we pray for physical strength and healing, but we pray in a greater way. You be glorified in this uh, test that they have, and uh, may the hope that we have in Christ be seen in them. May our message go clearly tomorrow and, and Wednesday night on Christmas Eve. And I pray for hearts to be receptive to Jesus Christ. Now, guide us as we look at your word tonight. And, uh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the news items of this past year is um, had to do with cell phone security. <coughs> and raised the question when you pick up that cell phone and call or text, who all listens and tracks on that call? Well, I know it was upsetting to many to find that their uh, communications were not as private as they thought. The idea that someone might be eavesdropping on, on my own cell phone is not so much disturbing to me as far as being afraid of it. It disturbs me that someone would have such a boring life. <laughs> <laughs> Our texting would look something like this. And Carolyn's phone, lunch, for mine, okay. Next day, lunch. Okay. <laughs> Are you coming? On my way. <laughs> kind of even irritates me that someone would spend. I wanted to text them and say, get a life. I might do that tomorrow, so I'll you. <laughs> but you know, we have that opportunity to eavesdrop in a certain sense on a conversation that was much greater than that. It's uh, that conversation that took place in heaven. Let's see, are we going to have a, a picture up here? Uh, that took place when uh, Jesus was sent from heaven into the world. I find it in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 7. And uh, I'll just read that, or you can follow along. It's uh, the text for my message here this evening on the reason that Jesus came. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, and that, that's the statement right there, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. Now, as you uh, read those, oh, it is there. I'm just not seeing it back here. Now. So, uh, yeah, good. four questions that are uh, important on that. First of all, who is this Christ who came into the world? Number two, why did he need to come into the world? Number three, what did he do when he came into the world? And number four, what in the world should I do about it? And so uh, let's consider what is maybe not the most frequently used Christmas passage. But yet speaks exactly of what happened at Christmas here in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Number one, who is this Christ who came into the world? For it says, therefore, when Christ came into the world. That's one of the most important questions that each person must answer. Who is Jesus Christ? And if you can correctly answer that question with understanding, then Christmas comes in, you can answer as well why he came to earth. It was Martin Luther who saw this 
when he said, If anyone stands firm and right on this point, that Jesus Christ is true God and true man, who died and rose again for us, all the other articles of the Christian faith will fall into place for him and firmly sustain him. Read that again. If anyone stands firm and right on this point, the question is, who is Jesus Christ? That Jesus Christ is true God, a true man, who died and rose again for us, all the other articles of the Christian faith will fall in place for him and firmly sustain him. Someone else has noted that all the errors, the heresies, the idolatries, the offenses, abuses, and ungodliness in the church have originally arisen because of that part of the Christian faith concerning Jesus Christ, which has been either despised or lost. The Christmas story is not primarily about the birth of a baby who would grow up to become a great moral teacher and example, although Jesus did become those things. Rather, it is the profound birth of a Savior. So who is this Christ who came into the world will say, is Jesus Christ born of the Virgin Mary? Matthew 1 reveals that the birth of Jesus was no ordinary birth. Mary was with child by the Holy Spirit, apart from the way all other babies have been born in normal relationships of a woman with a man. The virgin birth, even now, is rejected by skeptics. Why? Because it's unnatural, it's miraculous. But Matthew, one of, who was one of the twelve, had direct access both to Jesus and Mary. And Luke, the historian, probably interviewed Mary, because in Luke 1.3 he states that he carefully researched before writing his gospel. And both these, Matthew and Luke, affirm the miraculous virgin birth of Christ. To reject this as actual history is to reject the testimony of two independent historians who lived at that time and whose writings have been accepted as factual history by scholars. The only reason, then, for rejecting the miraculous events is because people just have an arbitrary bias against all miracles, which is a bias against God himself. God can interrupt the laws of his creation whenever he wants, and according to his purpose. But we could say that based on who God is, it is reasonable to accept the virgin birth of Christ as historically true. Well, what makes this such a big deal? Why does it matter whether Jesus was born of a virgin or not? Is it necessary to affirm that? Well, because Jesus is the eternal God in human flesh, the virgin birth is essential to affirm the deity of Jesus Christ. If he was born of a human mother and father, the way you and I were, just through the normal biological processes, then he could not be God in human flesh. Under those circumstances, he might be a man upon whom God's spirit rested in an unusual sense, but he still would have been only a man. His existence would have begun at conception, and thus he would not have been the eternal God in human flesh. At many times, Jesus claimed that he was sent into this world from heaven, assuming a prior existence. He told the Jews before Abraham was, I am. And so, he became God's perfect sacrifice for sin. Belief in the virgin birth is essential to affirm the sinless humanity of Jesus Christ. If he was born of natural parents, he was born a sinner like all human beings since the fall, he would have needed a savior himself. If he had sin of his own, he could not have died as a perfect substitute for your sin and mine. To be born as a man who fully shared our humanity, Jesus had to have a human parent. Through the superintendence of the Holy Spirit and the virgin birth, Jesus was born as fully human and yet sinless. The angel told Mary that because the Holy Spirit would come upon her, and the power of the Most High would overshadow her, he said, for that reason, the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. Even though Mary herself was a sinner in need of a Savior, as she acknowledges in Luke 147, Jesus was kept from her sin and born as fully human, yet 
without sin. Now, it's important for us to understand these things. It's not a dry <coughs> discussion to answer the question, who is this Christ who came into the world? As a sinless man, Jesus could represent the human race as a sin bearer. As God the Son, his sacrifice was acceptable before God the Father. The angel told Joseph, but he was to name this son that would be born Jesus, adding, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. That name, Jesus, the Hebrew form being Joshua, means Yahweh, or Jehovah, is salvation. And so the name Jesus points us to the very essence of his being, namely that he's the Savior. Christ is not his last name. Christ is, means that he's the Jewish Messiah. It means the anointed one. So Charles Spurgeon pointed out that since the Father knows Jesus perfectly, when he directed that he be named Jesus, he was giving him the best, most appropriate name possible. By giving Jesus that name, the Father commissioned him to save sinners. So the answer to the question, who came, is that Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary, is none other than the eternal God who came in human flesh and that he came to earth primarily as the Savior. The second question that this passage in Hebrews 10 brings up is, why did he need to come into the world? Why? Quotes from the Old Testament Psalm saying, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. When we read the Old Testament, we read about the, the system of sacrifices that didn't begin with Moses and the law. It actually began in the garden with Adam and Eve and the skins that were provided as a covering for them, requiring the death of innocent animals in order to clothe the sinful first couple. Noah, after the flood, sacrificed seven clean animals and birds, as we read in Genesis 8. In Abraham and Isaac, we see the, the offering of sacrifices. Maybe the most notorious one that comes to mind is that when Abraham and his son Isaac in Genesis 22 went to Mount Moriah under God's instruction where Abraham was to offer his one and only son, Isaac, as a sacrifice. And as we read there, the two of them went on together. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son. Abraham replied, The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. This course is the story when God did provide a ram in the thicket, caught by his horns, even as Abraham was prepared to do the awful thing of killing his son. Isaac was spared. God provided the lamb, as Abraham said, but it certainly it had a profound application long range that God would provide the lamb. We saw the picture of it in Moses in the Passover, a lamb without blemish, observed from the 10th to the 14th days, picturing Christ in so many different ways. The years that he had an earthly ministry, slaughtered at sunset, cooked and eaten with bitter herbs, and no bone broken, none kept around. For leftovers later. All of these wonderful pictures of Christ who would be the fulfillment of all of these Old Testament sacrifices. See, this was part of the law. And Hebrews 10 verses 1 through 4 says the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities in themselves. For this reason it can never, by the same sacrifice that's repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For their worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. We trace some of the very earliest Old Testament history. If you went back before the cross about as far as we are after, so you go two millennia before the cross, you're in the time of Abraham. But you can go back 
even before that, and we have these sacrifices taking place that, as Hebrews tells us, wouldn't do what really needed to be done, and that's remove the sin. It was only a temporary covering. In all of these sacrifices, the guilt was covered, but not removed. God could say, the repentance and obedience is what I required. Still, there is no finished salvation. What I really want is their heart. So what would he do for sinners? Well, as the angel said, given the name of Jesus, he will save his people from their sins. There was a time when, in the life and ministry of Christ, there was question about why he had such an affinity for sinful people. And Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You see, as we're looking at this question, why did he come? Why did he come? What was his, why did he need to come into the world? And, and we see that the sacrifice, sacrifice and offerings weren't going to make a permanent solution. Paul wrote, here is a trustworthy saint that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. You see, he would be that sacrifice. He came to save his people from their sins. Consider the meaning of the word save. You don't save someone who's over here saying, a little help. They really don't need to be saved. You save someone who's unable to do anything to save himself. Someone who's lost at sea needs to be saving. Needs saving. Someone who stopped breathing needs to be saved. This means that prior to Jesus saving them, people were helplessly, hopelessly lost in their sins. They were alienated from God under His righteous judgment and unable to free themselves from this condition. A Savior is one who has the power to rescue people who could not rescue themselves. And this is Jesus who has the God-given power sent on a mission to save His people from their sins. Jesus Christ, God in human flesh. When I was a little boy, I memorized among the verses that uh, my parents helped me to learn. Luke 19.10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. People were lost, alienated from God because of their sins. And so we see that Jesus Christ, who is eternal God, took on human flesh to be that sacrifice to save his people from their sins. But what did he really do when he came into the world? When he said, here I am, it's written about me in the scroll, I have come to do your will, O God. We could maybe have a group discussion right now. What was God's will in his coming? And Well, we could say he came to reveal God and his love. He came to heal the sick and minister to the needy. To bring peace, to teach truth, to fulfill the law, to offer a kingdom, to show us how to live. Yet couldn't he have done all of these things without becoming a human like us? Because it wasn't his birth that provided our salvation. His sinless life didn't provide the salvation. His perfect example did not solve the sin problem. His teaching was not adequate. Someone had to die. And so, what was God's will and plan? That Jesus came with the knowledge. And he came, said, in heaven, I've come to do your will, O God. That he would be the final and ultimate sacrifice for sin. That his body had been divinely prepared, prepared by God specifically for that purpose. That he would die for the sins of the world. And we know that he was doing it willingly. Why he's identified in Romans 13.8 as the land that was slain before the creation of the world. Or Hebrews 4.3 where it says, And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. And so, when we read the Christmas story, that while we were there, the time came for the baby to be born. We know that the physical gestation period of nine months had, had come to its time when... Uh, 
the contractions began and Mary gave birth to a human baby. But as Galatians 4, 4, 5 says, when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. That's why someone wrote, here's a side of the Christian story that is not often told. Those soft old hands, fashioned by the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb, were made so that nails might be driven through them. Those baby feet, pink and unable to walk, would one day walk up a dusty hill to be nailed to a cross. That sweet infant's head, with sparkling eyes and eager mouth, was formed so that someday men might force a crown of thorns on it. That tender body, warm and soft, wrapped, wrapped in swaddling clothes, would one day be opened by a spirit. Jesus was born to die. In all of this imagery that tears at our sensitivities, we should remember that even though Jesus' death was devised and carried out by men with evil intentions, it was in no sense a tragedy. It represents the greatest victory over evil that anyone has ever accomplished. <clears throat> Forgive me for using a worn out illustration, but I am challenged each time I look at this story of a certain Dr. A.J. Gordon, who passed the church in Boston many years ago, who tells how he one day met a little boy out in front of his church. The boy was carrying a rusty bird cage in his hands and several little birds were fluttering around inside at the bottom of the cage as if they knew they were going to be destroyed. <coughs> Dr. Gordon said, son, where did you get those birds? And the boy answered, I trapped them out of the field. What are you going to do with them? The preacher asked. I'm going to take them and play with them and have some fun with them. What will you do with them when you get through playing with them? Dr. Gordon asked. And also the boy, I guess I'll just feed them to an old cat and have around the house. Then Dr. Gordon asked the boy how much he would take for the birds, and the boy answered, Mister, you don't want these birds. They're just little old field birds, and they can't sing very well. Dr. Gordon said, I'll give you two dollars for the cage and the birds. All right, said the boy, it's a deal, but you're making a bad bargain. Exchange was made, and the boy went whistling down the street, happy because he had two dollars in his pocket. Dr. Gordon took his cage out behind his church and opened the door of the cage, and the birds flew out and went soaring away into the blue, singing as they went. The next Sunday, Dr. Gordon stood there in the front of the church, took the empty bird cage to his pulpit to use it in illustrating his sermon, and they said, that little boy said that the birds could not sing very well, but when I released them from the cage, they went away, singing into the blue, and it seemed that they were singing, redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. <laughs> you see, that's what the word redeemed means purchased, and set free? The answer is, he actually saved his people from their sin. He redeemed those under the law. And so when he saves them from their sin, Jesus' death on the cross, that substitutionary sacrifice, died in the place of those he came to save, Saving them from the, their sins, and he saves and delivers them from the penalty of the sin, which is eternal punishment in hell. But he also saves his people from the power of that sin, which happens in their daily lives gradually as they learn to walk in dependence on the Holy Spirit. So then we come to our final question What in the world should I do about it? Well, to continue reading in that 10th chapter of Hebrews. It says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. He looks back to Jeremiah 31, putting their law, putting his law in their hearts, writing on their minds, and then promising that I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of those, there is no longer any offering for sin. But then he goes on to say, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, he says, let us draw near. Let us draw near with a true heart 
in full assurance of faith. And later in that passage says, we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but are those who believe and are saved. As I said, that Hebrew name Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. If you do not know Jesus as your Savior, then you don't know him at all because Jesus Christ came to save people from their sin. So the message that I bring to you tonight is for you. If you've never sinned or failed, but I have that special opportunity to speak to those who maybe are feeling in a special way the need of a Savior. And I know that there are in this community and possibly in our church and those who have been told by their parents that they were more trouble than they were worth. Believe that message and prove them right. People who hesitate about coming into a church service such as this feeling they'd be out of place in a religious setting. So I can say to that person who's been known as someone who lived on the wild side who tried to have a good time but ended up feeling ashamed of themselves. Maybe you cringe looking back thinking of some of the things that you've done. You said something you thought would be funny and wasn't at all and you saw the hurt in that other person's eyes. Maybe you've been so angry you wanted to let someone have it and you proceeded to do so. Found yourself continually saying things that weren't true. Struggled in life, experiencing inward pain and outward broken relationship. Said to yourself, I'm just a loser. I never seem to do things the right way. Nothing good ever seems to happen to me. To the person who feels broken inside, never thought as a child that their life would end up like this, as it is now. And so I can say if you've cursed, stolen, lied, killed, committed adultery, participated in sexual perversion, lived in unspeakable conditions. You are the ones that God has special interest in tonight. You are the ones that are eligible to receive God's gift. For as it said in Matthew 1, 21, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus said, he would say, are you one of his people? Has God opened your eyes to see that you're a sinner who deserves his judgment? If you think you're a pretty good person in God's sight, you're not one of those people. But if you can say, yes, I know that I'm a sinner deserving God's judgment, then the next question is, have you drawn near to the cross of Christ? Are you trusting in his shed blood alone to pay the penalty <coughs> for your sin? Father, we pray that you might help us to be able to recognize in this Christmas season the story of the one who said to his father, I've come to do your will. That all the sacrifices made, all the animals, innocent substitutes that died, did not remove the sin. The only point of the one who would be the perfect plan would come. May we recognize in our own selves the sin that needed the Savior. May each person here tonight be able to say with assurance and confidence that they can put their trust in Jesus Christ. And if not, may they open their heart to Him. How thankful we are for a gospel in which we are eligible, if we are sinners, to come to you, draw near to you, to be saved from that sin, from its penalty and from its power in our life. And then may we, with joy, Tell the story of redemption. Redeem with the love of God. Thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together this time.
wonderful thing to be able to uh, sing of the arrival of our Savior. But I trust that as you in this coming week go through the activities and all that is involved in traditions and, and uh, whatever Christmas will mean to you, that you pray for one another, pray that God's purpose, sending His Son, will be fulfilled. And I'd ask you to pray for Carolyn and I as well. The Christmas Eve service is one that we prepared long ahead for because it's the greatest opportunity that we as a church have to present the gospel in the whole year. And people come here and have been in times past because we make it a very special thing. But we also are going to be uh, tested in our, in our own lives as far as living out what we looked at and were save and extend his grace to those who needed salvation. And so pray for us that we live this truth in our lives and in our family as well. Let's bow. Father, thank you for this opportunity to be here together this evening. And as we fellowship even afterward, may it be in the context of, of this special and unique privilege we have as being brought into your family and being uh, able to come together with your people. May Jesus Christ receive praise in all that we say to you. And may we be faithful and true to you, that which you have revealed as righteousness in your word. Thank you for the salvation that you have brought to us. And may we see hearts and lives of people being changed as we share that news with others. Guide us and bless us. And may your, your name be be raised up in this coming week, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. That'd be great. Oh, we already turned it off. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's all right. I'll turn.